Prisoners kept in inhuman or degrading conditions. Plaintiffs who have waited many years for their cases to be resolved in the civil courts. Parents of children taken into care. Journalists prosecuted or persecuted for criticizing politicians. These are just some of the people turning to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. There are very many others. Since 1995, the court has been housed here in a building designed by British architect Sir Richard Rogers, with its vast glass reception area a symbol of the court's accessibility. Here is the main courtroom. In the center, the carpet shows the 12 stars of the European flag. Originally conceived as a logo for the Council of Europe, now also adopted by the European Union as a symbol of European solidarity. This is where public hearings are held before the court's judges, sitting either in chambers of seven judges or, as in this case, as the Grand Chamber composed of 17 judges. La Cour. On the 1st of November 1998, a new court was inaugurated following a radical reform. Since then, the court has comprised full-time judges from almost 50 European countries. Judges bring with them expert knowledge of their country's laws and legal system. They are fully independent and do not represent any national interests. Je déclare solennellement que j'exercerai mes fonctions de juge avec honneur, indépendance et impartialité. And that I will keep secret all deliberations. Thank you very much. Established in 1949, when images of concentration camps and other Second World War atrocities were still fresh in people's minds, the Council's mission was, and remains today, to safeguard peace through the promotion and protection of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law across Europe. With these goals in mind, the Council's first and most important treaty was drafted, the European Convention on Human Rights. The convention was initially signed on the 4th of November 1950 by 12 countries. It entered into force in September 1953. In 1959, the European Court of Human Rights was set up with the task of examining alleged violations of the convention. Article 2. Everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. Никто не должен подвергаться ни пыткам, ни бесчеловечному. Nul ne peut être tenu en esclavage ni en servitude. Among others, the convention guarantees freedom of expression, freedom of thought and religion, the right to liberty and security, the right to respect for private and family life, and the right to marry and to an education. The most fundamental of all is the right to life.
The court has dealt with a number of cases concerning disappearances or deaths of people taken into custody in police stations or prisons, sometimes into custody not even acknowledged by the authorities. Some of these cases, lodged against the Russian Federation, concern the treatment of the Chechen population. The prohibition of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment is another fundamental right. In 1999, France was found to be responsible for the torture of Ahmed Selmouni, a convicted drug smuggler, while he was in police custody. The court upheld Mr. Selmouni's allegations that police officers had urinated over him, struck him, and threatened him with a blow lamp and a syringe. In 1989, the court found that there would have been a violation of Article 3 if the United Kingdom had extradited Jens Suring, a German national, to the state of Virginia in the United States of America, where he was charged with the murder of his girlfriend's parents. The court found that because the death penalty was in force in Virginia, Mr. Zering risked spending six to eight years on death row, not knowing whether he would be executed or not. This in itself, the court ruled, would have amounted to inhuman and degrading treatment. The most common complaints brought before the court, however, concern the right to a fair hearing, especially the length of time people have had to wait for their cases to be resolved. This problem is most prevalent in Poland and especially Italy. Many thousands of cases have come to the court from applicants, some of whom have waited over 20 years for a final judgment. Many cases concerning the failure to execute final judicial decisions have also been brought against Russia and Ukraine. For example, Anatoly Burdov, who worked on the Chernobyl site following the nuclear disaster, had to wait for several years before the Russian authorities paid him the compensation awarded by the courts for his health problems. For more than 50 years, the court has ruled on numerous social issues. These include abortion, assisted suicide, strip searches, domestic slavery, the right of a person whose birth mother requested confidentiality to find out about his or her origins, adoption by homosexual couples, wearing an Islamic headscarf in education institutions, the protection of journalist sources, discrimination against Roma, or environmental problems. Prior to the creation of the convention system and its various protocols, individuals could not bring complaints of human rights abuses against their own governments before an international court. Neither could one government bring a case concerning another government's treatment of its own people. From the beginning, almost all the cases submitted to the court have come from individual members of the general public. Sometimes applicants are well known in their own country or even internationally. One example is Princess Caroline of Hanover. In 2004, the court found in her favor in a case brought against Germany. The state was found to have breached the princess's right to respect for family life by allowing the publication of paparazzi photos taken without her knowledge. Court cases can also touch on politically sensitive issues, such as the prosecution of those responsible for the shootings of East Germans trying to flee to the West across the Berlin Wall. Egon Krenz, who was president of the Council of State at the time of the events in question, contested the legality of his murder conviction for the shootings. However, the court held unanimously that there had been no violation of his rights under the convention. One aspect of the convention system that some people find difficult to accept is that the rights and freedoms it guarantees apply to everyone, including convicted criminals. For example, the court ruled that two ten-year-old British boys who murdered a toddler had not had a fair hearing. It was found that they had been unable to participate effectively in their trial, which lasted three weeks in public, in an adult court not adapted to the needs of such young offenders.
Overall, the sheer number of people protected by the convention system is staggering. There are around 800 million people living in the countries which have ratified the convention alone. An area stretching across 18 time zones, from Greenland to Cyprus, and from Portugal to Vladivostok in eastern Russia. Non-Europeans, whether refugees, tourists, or people who happen to be within the jurisdiction of the country concerned, are also protected. For instance, the court found in 2006 that Belgium had violated the convention by holding a five-year-old Congolese girl for more than two months in a transit zone at Brussels airport. Not everyone turning to the court for help is successful in bringing a case, however. The court receives many hundreds of letters and telephone calls a day, as well as faxes and emails. Applications are sorted and then sent to one of the units within the court. From then on, there are a number of criteria to meet. Applicants must have exhausted all the legal remedies in the country concerned, which can take many years. They must also apply to the court within six months of the final decision at national level. They must be able to claim that at least one of their rights protected under the convention has been violated and that one of the countries which has ratified the convention is responsible. The events in question must also have taken place after the state concerned ratified the convention. For Ukraine, for example, this means that events which occurred before 11th of September 1997 are not covered. All decisions on whether or not a case is admissible are taken by judges sitting as three judge committees, seven judge chambers, or as a grand chamber of 17 judges. The court goes on to deliver judgment only in admissible cases. It rules on whether or not there's been a violation of the convention and may award damages. It also decided that the other three applicants were to perfect their parliamentary office. The judgments are binding in that the state concerned must pay any compensation awarded, deal with the issues raised for the individual concerned, and take general measures to solve any underlying problems, to make sure the same situation does not occur again. Possible measures include enacting a new law or reforming a procedure. Ensuring that the court's judgments are respected and that the necessary remedial action is taken is the task of the Council of Europe's executive arm, the Committee of Ministers. This is made up of the foreign affairs ministers of the Council's member states or their permanent representatives. The Committee of Ministers meets regularly to discuss the execution of court judgments. Cases remain on its books until members are satisfied that the judgment has been implemented and that appropriate measures have been put in place to ensure that the same problem does not recur. The presence of representatives of all the Council's member states ensures that political pressure can be brought to bear on countries that are slow to meet their obligations. The court's judgments have led to a great many changes in national legislation and, among other examples, have opened the way for retrials of individuals convicted following an unfair trial, for the restoration of expropriated properties to their owners or the payment of appropriate compensation, or for the granting of a residence permit to individuals threatened with deportation, and equal treatment for German nationals and foreigners with regard to the payment of family allowances. Today, although the court is more productive than ever before, staff are working under ever-increasing pressure. The number of new applications coming to the court is growing all the time. There are large numbers of often complex cases arriving from the newest states to join the convention system, while new protocols to the convention prohibiting discrimination and the death penalty will further add to the court's caseload. There is only so much rationalization the court can do, however. Ultimately, governments must take action at national level 
both by ensuring that the court's judgments are rapidly implemented and by resolving the underlying legal and human rights problems. For half a century, the court has been a bastion of human rights in Europe, Europe's conscience. To be effective for another 50 years and beyond, it will need the continued support of Europe's governments.